Good evening, everyone. My name's Christian Jewell, and I'm the manager of the Asia Pacific Design Library here at State Library. Um, as is customary, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're gathering on tonight, the Turrbal and Yugara people, and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. I'd like to welcome you all tonight to our APDL lecture series entitled Side Project. Um, we're talking about the uh, passion projects that our designers uh, undertake outside their primary design work. We're interested in, in uh, the world of inspiration outside of the nine to five and that delicate balance between uh, work and life. Um, before we start, can I just ask if you have your mobile phone with you to put it on silent or switch it off? Um, particularly if you're, uh, we want you to use Twitter as well, so put it on silent and you can follow um, the conversation on Twitter tonight using the hashtag APDL lecture. Um, we've got some microphones here and, and we're going to try and also come around. So if you have a question uh, during tonight's conversation, we really encourage you to put your hand up or come and just grab a mic. The format for this series is a little different to your traditional stand and deliver um, slideshow uh, lecture series. So the, the conversation is really the most exciting part and, and we want to uh, involve you in that conversation as well. And the most exciting part of tonight's event, in my opinion, is the post-event networking uh, function that's taking place in the design lounge afterwards. So if you haven't booked a spot for that, we can still welcome you in. But um, as you'll find out, Kevin has uh, created this game called Design Nerd, and tonight he will be hosting uh, as Super Quizmaster um, the inaugural APDL Design Nerd Challenge. So uh, there's prizes up for grabs come and join us for a drink in the Design Lounge and your chance also to speak to, to Shane and Kevin. Um, I'll now hand over to Shane to um, kick off tonight's conversation with Kevin Finn. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, um, and a pleasure to be here again. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. Uh, I think, um, I guess, maybe I say this each time, but I think we... We do have a, a special guest tonight in Kevin Finn from The Sum Of, or The Sum Of includes Kevin Finn. Um, and uh, Kevin has a very curious background, which rather than talking about now, we hope to reveal a little bit about tonight and for him to share uh, what, um, in the little short bits of time that I've had to talk to Kevin, um, uh, what I perceive as someone who's a bit wiser than, uh, than his years. He's certainly a faster learner about life as a designer than I was, um, uh, or probably still am in many ways. Um, so welcome, Kevin, Thank to you. the side project. Thank you. Um, you have a very interesting and particular take on the side project. Uh, mm. So I'm not going to ask you really what your side project is, but I'm going to ask you to... Tell us about what you think about the whole idea of a side project. Yeah, uh, I think it's, um, it's important to understand what a side project is most of the time. And um, I know in, in my case, it, uh, it begins with, I need to do something outside of work because I'm not getting something in work and I, I'm a bit frustrated with something or I'm interested in something else and I'm going to do it because it gives me a chance to do something that I don't get to do at work. And that's how side projects begin, which I think is fine. But in my experience, and this is a recent discovery, um, <clears throat> I think it's important to very quickly move out of side project thinking, which might sound surprising. Um, if or, you... or is it important to move out of... Um real work thinking and into side project thinking? As a I don't see a distinction. Yeah. I, I say to myself that uh, if I'm doing something that is a side project which I'm passionate about, then um, that's what I'm passionate about. If I can't get that in my job, if I can't bring it into my job, then my side project idea supersedes my job. So you've got to look at your side project <clears throat> and decide, is this something I want to make a living on? If it's something I want to make a living on, don't call it a side project. Call it what I call it as a self-client. If you're in a business for yourself, um, you can absorb that into your business, and it's, you treat it like a client. A client needs um, time, investment, ideas, 
Um, if you're in the side project mentality, you get to it when you get to it. Um, you're doing it on weekends, evenings, you go to work, you get frustrated at work because you want to be doing your side project, but it's going nowhere because it stays in the side project so headspace. How did you come to this realisation? When did this epiphany come um, <clears throat> Well, upon it, you? It, it came to me, um, sorry, just to kind of uh, finish up on that, the other side, if you're not in a side project mentality and, and you're not in a self-client mentality, call it a hobby. And don't feel guilty about not doing it every evening and every weekend. If it's a self-client and you find yourself doing it every weekend, every evening, then you should do what... Um, there's a, a, a business guru guy called Jordan Belfort, some of you might know, is called The Wolf of Wall Street. Um, I went to a seminar of his once and his opening line was, um, find what your passion is and <coughs> monetize that passion. Mm. That's what I'm talking about with self client. You realise this kills all of the other questions for this evening because the other <laughs> questions are about your side project, but I'm sure we'll find a way to uh, no, absolutely because entertain uh, to, ourselves. To, to, to get to, you know, yep. you saying, how did I discover this? Mm. Um, when I moved to Brisbane in 2010, uh, previously I was, I was living in, in remote Kununurra up on the top of Western Australia, and uh, I moved to Brisbane, and within that first year, um, I found it difficult to network within Brisbane. It, it mm -hmm. felt like a bit of a closed shop, a bit of a club. And I wasn't really seeing um, how I could get new clients and new projects as quickly as I was hoping. Now, I sat in my studio and I thought, okay, there's, there's two ways that we can do this. I can do the traditional model of I've got to go find new business, do a new business push. Or I can say... Um, if I go to my clients, I will bring ideas and suggestions and I'll, I'll try and uncover opportunities for them from a business point of view as well as from a creative point of view. Why don't I apply that to myself? Now, I had been kicking around the idea of Design Nerd as a, um, as a, a vehicle to do what we might now call a side project, but I didn't know what I was going to do with it. But that day in my studio when I was thinking, I'm not going to go and do a new business push. I'm going to try and create my own revenue stream. I'm going to treat this side project as um, a, a, an integral part of my business. I'm interested in what I might be able to do with this design nerd idea. Why can't I, like Jordan Belfort says, monetize that? And it was a shift in my thinking that made me immediately say, this is not something I'm going to be doing for the fun. This is something I'm going to make fun. I'm going to make money from making, having fun. It's, it's, it had to have a business plan around it. Mm. Where on the other hand, Open Manifesto, <coughs> my publication, um, that was always just what you might call a side project, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a research stream. I was more interested in the knowledge I was getting there. I was more interested in saying, hey, this is cool. I can do a publication, and that's great. It never really made money. Perhaps at this point and because I purposely didn't offer an introduction, uh, perhaps we should tell people a little bit about mm. your, particularly given that you've killed all my questions <laughs> Sorry. about side projects, but I'll find a way to yeah. get back to those. But perhaps at this point you could introduce um, um, a little bit of background about yourself because, I mean, simplistically we could say you're a graphic designer, but I, I think you're far from that from your work and your whole approach to it. Uh, in many ways you're a strategic thinker yeah. and, and that, that graphic design is sort of where you might have come from, but it's not where you are. Yeah, I mean, and, and thank you for that observation because um, that's something that I, I found it difficult to acknowledge because we're all trained and uh, we're, we're kind of hardwired to say, you graduated as this, an architect, a graphic designer, that's what you do. Um, but I was getting... Interesting, when I left... Um, Saatchi Design. I, I was the joint creative director of Saatchi Design in Sydney, part of the Saatchi and Saatchi Global Advertising Network. I was, I was there for seven years. And there I was just interested in, in doing creative work with clients. Then we, we moved to the middle of nowhere uh, and I had to set up my own company. And I, like most creatives, kind of went, oh, business, business, boring business. Can I just do what I like doing? Can I just design? What happened was I saw how 
creative business has to be. And I thought, well, hang on, there's something really interesting here. And I got interested in business. But I got interested in business in a way that really surprised me in an entrepreneurial sense. Mm -hmm. um, when anyone sets up a business, and you would know this yourself, that it's, it's not just you're setting up a business. You, you do have to think like an entrepreneur because you've got to, if not for yourself, for your clients, mm -hmm. think like an entrepreneur, how you can maximize opportunities. And, and you can fall into the trap if you think it's all about how am I going to generate cash flow. Yeah, exactly. Um, rather than what is it that I, how do I want to spend my days and how yep. do I, if you like, uh, monetize that. Exactly, yeah. There's mm. a, a, a designer, an industrial designer in New York, uh, Aya Spissel, and she works um, clients with Herman Miller and, and that. I recently came across a, a quote which just absolutely hit me in the heart. And she said, um, uh, your life is your greatest project. Mm. Now by that, I think well, if we look at our side projects and we're really passionate about them, and then we think, well, actually, if it, what if it's a self-client that I can monetize that passion? And how, how, if I monetize that passion, how's it going to impact the life that I live? Because this is not just about going to work and doing a job. Even if it's a passionate job, I honestly believe in what uh, I.S. Bissell says by, by saying we have to design the life that we want to live. And if you have an entrepreneurial take on that and you get excited about what business can, can do for you, um, I think there's a, a, a greater chance to then marry business and creativity mm -hmm. um, for a life that you want to live. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I started to actively look uh, into reading about strategy, reading about business, going to business conferences and seminars, um, learning the stuff I didn't know. Yeah. Um, because I wasn't trained how to be uh, an entrepreneur or a business person. I think if we took, uh, say, a very dry interpretation of what you were saying, um, we could interpret that as you being on all the time yeah. in terms of thinking about business mm -hmm. um, in, in, in parenthesis. Yeah. But so could you describe to us, given that, um, and I think part of what you're saying is you don't have a side project because th th there's, there's this uh, interwoven um, mm. relationship between how you live your life and how you, uh, and how you do your work. Could you perhaps describe for us the rhythm of your, of your work and your family life? I mean, you're a father, yeah. Yeah. a young child, yeah. and I know you're very committed to parenting uh, yeah. as well, and how you uh, make all of that work. Uh, uh, um. yeah. And I think it goes back to what Bissell says, you know, your life is your greatest project. I think it is a case of consciously saying, um, if, if you look from a, a, a business point of view, the, the model that we normally use is fee-for-service. And you're constantly chasing new business and you're constantly then um, looking to um, cater to your clients and do, do what we're supposed to do. If you start thinking from an entrepreneurial point of view, you can start to get what most client commissions don't offer, control. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting I have control over my self-clients at the moment. They're, it's in transition, but we're, we're heading that way. Um, and you can start looking at it saying, well, if I'm thinking about it in a way that I'm going to try and de um, design my life, if you like, or if I'm looking at it from an entrepreneurial point of view, um, then I start thinking, is there a way that we can maximize the return and maybe create not just new revenue streams, but even passive revenue streams. So you're not putting in so much effort and time day to day, hour, hour by hour with, with a fee-for-service client um, situation. You're actually setting up a model that allows you more time. And that more time, you can then use whichever way you like. Mm -hmm. You can say, well, um, you know, rather than a five-day a week or, or, or you know, maybe I'll do a three or four-day a week and yep. spend time with my family. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll do a five-day a week, but I'm only going to do a five-hour a day mm -hmm. um, because I have set it up that I'm getting a new revenue stream that I have control over. And if we apply what we know in our, in our business to your self-client, mm -hmm. then the, um, the, the goal or the hope is that we can use our expertise and skills for our benefit. Some, some might say that's very brave, and I'm wondering, um, was there a level of comfort your years at Saatchi? Did that give you, a, did that give you a, if you like, a, um, uh, say, a, a financial 
position that allowed you to be braver than you might have been if you were a recent graduate that had that understanding but you know really just couldn't make the leap um, so uh, did you not. do you see it as brave or did you just see it as it was um, it was something that was uh, a calling yeah. inside you that at yeah. th that point you had no choice but to go in that direction because that's what you want mm. that's just what your yeah. being said it wanted to do well there's a couple of questions there one financial security give me confidence no mm. um, my wife was in Kununurra a, a year before I moved there um, we used to meet once a month in Perth mm. um, I pretty much blew all my savings on four-hour flights to Perth every month um, and then setting up a business when I moved to Kununurra so the truth of it is uh, when I moved to Kununurra I had very little money and zero clients mm. I then had one potential client that was going to give me maybe three interesting projects right across the top end uh, and after the second week um, I realized it wasn't a good fit and fired my only client with no money and no other clients. Now that brings you to the next thing, confidence or, or courage. Mm -hmm. I think my time at Saatchi, um, I think it gave me a lot of good sort of attributes and characteristics but I don't think it, it um, really directly fed into that, mm -hmm. uh, those decisions. I think those decisions were made because of a physical reaction. Uh, when I was working with that client, uh, talking to that initial client that I, I, um, I withdrew from, um, when the phone rang, I, I, got, I felt queasy. I had a physical reaction. I was going, this isn't going well. So my choice there was, do I continue down this track and I don't have any jobs coming in? So, yeah. Or do I, f and, and do I feel sick? Or do I just say, well, I'd rather spend my time trying to replace that client with mm -hmm. something else? I would suggest less courage, less confidence, and more just a natural, it, it was a natural thing, I just, I just I couldn't not do it. So I think part of what I'm hearing you say, or another way of maybe thinking about it, um, perhaps, is that um, uh, you develop this understanding or this innate um, sense that um, when you're working, if you like, for a fee for service mm. for someone else, um, uh, that's, that's, if you like, a job Whereas, um, and that, this is a bit simplistic, mm, but um, the attitude that we take into a side project is we're doing it for ourselves, yep. not doing it for anybody else for ourselves. We just please ourselves. And we need to take, that's what we need to take into our everyday mm. job. So what you were drawn to was this idea of, um, of that, that sense and that kind of mindset um, in the way that you approach your practice. Mm. And it's interesting, there's, there's two, two sides that which I think are very interesting. Number one, uh, yes, you're right. When I was thinking previously about working for a client, fee-for-service, it was a job. Now, it's truly a collaboration. Mm -hmm. When I go into my clients, I'm not talking about, because of the entrepreneurial aspect of my mm -hmm. self-clients, I'm now going to my, my commission clients saying, okay, this is, this is the brief that's on the table. How, have you thought bigger than that? Have you thought about, and I'm bringing in ideas that are more on the business modeling. I'm Which is also a bit like saying, how can I make this more interesting for myself? For or, everyone, yeah. yes. And yeah. I, I say that um, when I'm collaborating on my work, I'm not just talking about the photographers and the uh, illustrators, and the, I'm talking about the clients. Because I go into a client commission and I say, I'm an expert in my area, and you're an expert in your area. Let's collaborate. And that's not the kind of, I'm going to go in and question the brief and I'm going to write the brief. It's like, no, we'll talk about how we collectively can collaborate to make this more interesting for everyone, not just for me, for so, everyone. So the attitude is about, um, is to work with a client rather than for a client. The attitude is uh, more simple than that. Yep. The attitude is make it meaningful. Yeah. For, for both for, of you. For everyone. Yeah. yeah make it yeah. meaningful. If it's not meaningful, what's the point? Can I change direction a little bit sure. now? Um, many people would say that taking the time to write a book is often a side project. Yeah. Um, uh, you've written Open Manifesto. So um, uh, was that a, would you say that that was a side project at the time it was Initially written? Initially it was, yeah. <coughs> Initially, the, the kind of background, and some of you may know a bit of this history, so apologies for uh, I'll be quick. Um, I was 29 and I was joint creative director of Saatchi Design 
in Sydney. Um, we just won a major award, international award, the like, you know, rarest hen's teeth. And I was in a, in a, in a room at Saatchi's with our work on, on the wall. It was like a, a, a mini ex exhibition for the agency and for our clients. And I stood there and I thought, crap, I'm 29. And Mark said it earlier, we, I've peaked early. Oh, sorry, Chris. <laughs> uh, I've, pe I've, peaked, I've peaked early. I thought, what the hell? I mean, all I could see ahead of me was this hamster wheel. We get a brief. We do a job. We do the best we can. We try and win an award. We get a brief. We, you know, and I, I just thought, I've, I've done it. Oh, I've got to be something else. I've got to go and do a totally new career. I was 29. Mm -hmm. Um, and that scared me, but it scared me more to stay, even at Saatchi's, even, you know, award-winning, all that kind of stuff. It scared me that I went, I mean, I thought I wouldn't be at this point until I was 60, but here I am. Very fortunate, you know, but I'm here. So rather than then say, I'm just going to leave design, and try something new because it's a new challenge, how about I just completely question design, get to the heart of it, and not talk about what designers do, but how they think. And this was in 2004, I think. Um, so I, I, and this is very interesting. Um, I had been thinking about Open Manifesto for eight years. So when I was 21. Why didn't I do it when I was 21? And this is not to everyone. Um, I didn't think I was qualified. But then I went, so what? Just do it. If it falls over, fine. But just do it. Um, I have a, 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 <coughs> sort of a, a new philosophy that I, um, I've recently come across myself uh, that I've, I've written. Um, if you try and don't succeed, well, at least you've conquered failure or fear, I should say. If you can conquer the fear of not getting something done right, you'll do something else or you'll, just, you'll have the courage to do something else or you'll have the courage to try something else or you'll have the courage to look at what you've done and see if you can make it better. When I did of Manifesto Issue 1, I thought, this won't go anywhere. It might not. But I'll just do what, what I'm interested in now. I looked at it at that point as, um, I'm going to invest money in it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to invest time in it. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was thinking in business terms, I was thinking, what's going to be my return on investment? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to invest time, money, effort, what's going to be my... I know I'm not going to make money on this. What's my return on investment? Knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I went into Open Manifesto as a side project just to get knowledge. And eight years later, uh, seven or eight years later, uh, i.e. recently, I kind of thought, well, hang on, can't Open Manifesto be a self-client? Mm -hmm. And it brings me to something I, I was going to say earlier when we were talking about the fee-for-service for a client and uh, doing it for myself. When a self-client works really well, it's when you take yourself out of it which is, sounds kind of counterintuitive. When you take yourself out of it and say, what if this was somebody else's project? What would I suggest? If this was a client, what would I suggest? Well, I'd suggest maybe you should do X, Y, Z. If you stay in the center of your self-client, you'll go, what do I want to do? You know, I'm just going to do it because I want to do it. And as I've got control and I don't care, I'm going to do it. And that's what I did for eight years. Mm -hmm. um, but now, I'm looking at Open Manifesto not being in the center of about me, even though I'm, I'm st I still love it, I still invest my time, my energy. Mm -hmm. in, but I'm saying, if you were a client, I would say, why aren't you doing e-books? Why aren't you getting all this IP onto digital assets? Why aren't you? Of course. you know. So now I'm re-looking at Open Manifesto and saying, there's other avenues that this can go in that if, if this was a client, I would have been advising them to do seven years ago. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, that's the kind of counterintuitive thinking that when you move from side project, which is all about you, into self-client, mm -hmm. which is all about the actual project, not mm -hmm. about you, you have control to do what you think is best for that client. The return is it will come back to you and anybody else that it touches. So you know, that might sound a bit kind of counterintuitive and complex, but that's kind of where I'm at now. Uh, well, I, as I well as I started out by saying, I think you have. Um, uh, it's, it would seem to me, and I think you've reinforced this again, that you've certainly reached a level of enlightenment, which it's taken me it took me a lot longer to get to, and perhaps I'm still going. Um, certainly, I've got a lot to learn in that sense. Um, uh, there is one of the questions, one of the, the, the standard questions here. I wanted to kind of 
say, investigate with you. Um, now, now, the question, the sort of standard question we have here for this sort of interview is whether you can clearly delineate between work and play. Mm -hmm. um, so yep. can you clearly delineate or is it more fluid than that? Um, I can clearly delineate that um, play is play. It's not work. It's not business. It's not monetizing a passion. It's play. And I know that because in one of my previous incarnations of my website, I should say, when I was in Kananara, I actually had a section on my website, play. And I was there for a while, and I remember sitting back going, what the fuck is that doing there? <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I say play is a... I'm a word person. I really am a word person. Uh, word, <laughs> words carry meaning. And I look at play and I say, play, unless you're saying this is serious play, play isn't serious enough. Play is just saying exactly like what side projects are. I'm going to experiment because I can't do it in my day job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to muck around because I can't do it in my day job. I'm going to do you know, fun stuff. Yep. And I look at that and I go, well, can't you make <coughs> money out of doing that? So play should be seen as being serious. So what is your play? What is your fun stuff? Apart from playing with, yep. your, um, playing with your family. And, uh, you um, I, I don't want to sound trite or you know, um, sort of throwaway, but I can honestly say... Play for me is life. I know yep. that sounds really big yep. and grand philosophical, but honestly, yep. because I look at it and I think to myself, well, you get up every day, you've got no idea what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, you've got to have a, um, a serious attitude to designing the life that you want, and you have to have uh, a sort of a, a lightness about you that says, well, whatever comes my way, I need to have a bit of humour about it too. Yep. Um, and, and I think it's that interplay between how serious and how lighthearted you can be, yep. rather than work and play. Yep. I look at it and say, um, there is that blurring of, of lines when you're, particularly when you're running your own business, that it, you kind of don't switch off. Yep. But um, I, I do sort of say to myself, there's no reason why I can't do five days a week, nine to six, have evenings off and have a weekend off, yeah. even though I work for myself. There's no reason why I can't say to myself, um, I'm incredibly serious about what I do, but we need humility and we need humour mm -hmm. within that. Uh, and it's that, it's that balance that okay. I, I look at, not, not the work and the play. Now, I don't know <coughs> if you're being evasive, but I'm still curious about what it actually is when you say that, you know, life is yeah. play. I mean, are, are, are you, are you, um, uh, you know, do you play football with some mates or do you no, um, do you go fishing or no, do you go uh, shopping or uh, I'm you know broke. No, no, no. <laughs> um, no I mean yeah when you when you look at that the, the kind of the fun side of it um, what what do I I, I absolutely enjoy meeting people yeah. I love travel um, my wife is a foodie and and she'll uh, introduce me to new foods um, yeah. I absolutely love uh, watching David Attenborough yeah um, I will you know any drop of a hat you find me at the cinema, not yeah. so much these days because yeah. you know I've got a baby. But um, so what? I, what I play for me, or where I kind of um, play? Play actually. Now that you mention it, would probably f move more into inspiration, yeah, rather than play. Yeah. And inspiration is it's in this room, it's outside that door, yeah. it's it's this. You know, yeah. inspiration is is everywhere. There's an um, there's a beautiful quote from um, the fashion designer Paul Smith who says. Um, you can find inspiration anywhere. And there's a little asterisk, and then the bottom. And if you can't, look again. Mm. And that is is really where I find the play side of it. That you go out and you, as long as you're interacting with people and things, and and you you're there to be inspired. Yeah. And then for me, that's where I have fun, and that's where I play. I think one of the things that's emerging from this series of talks is that. Um, Designers seem to be uh, uh, quite um, intense, but in a way, uh, and it's a mixed terms. It's mm. sort of casually intense uh, mm. observers of of the world, um, and not just in the visual sense, yeah. but um, are interested to see what music people are listening to, mm -hmm. the music, new cultural trends that are emerging, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be in fashion, music, mm. um, politics. Um, new social movements, um, changing values, yep. uh, and the like, and that um, uh, understanding 
and trying to make sense of the world yeah. and, and using design almost as a vehicle through which you can actually reflect that mm -hmm. back in a way and that um, it's hard to think that a designer wouldn't do that. Does that resonate with you in that yeah, sense as there's, well? There's two sides to that. Yeah. first side is that um, um, we... And, and designers or that phrase, I'll, I'll use it loosely, creatives would say, we, we have an innate desire to make the world a better place because we want to design it better. That's kind of, we, we see something and we say we can design that better. And I'm, I'm talking about every designer or creative, but a, a serious one will say, I see that, I can make that better, and that's what I want to do. Um, but the other side of it, which we don't talk about as much, is when you see or hear about a, a designer or a creative getting interested in those areas and those things, my belief, and at least in my experience, what that is actually doing is consciously or subconsciously understanding the context of wider culture. Because when we design something, it's got to sit into that culture. It's got to sit in context. We, we don't do anything in isolation that goes out into the world. Mm -hmm. And the more we know about what's happening in the world and context within where we operate, the better we can come to our self-clients or clients and, an, and have an informed opinion about the reason why I'm suggesting you should do this solution or this piece of design is because in context of the wider culture, it will sit here. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say, I mean, I look at life and that inspires me. And it's for that reason particularly that when we look at life broadly, um, it is the context for the work that we, the, the way we work and where our work sits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the more we know about that, the better our work can be. And if we then look at, uh, I mentioned David Attenborough, um, the best design you will find anywhere in the world is nature. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to look at the world in every aspect and say, how can we absorb that information, store it, and where required, use it in, in so our we're, work. So we're constantly um, we're, we're putting uh, ideas and observations in the bank for yeah, some and, future. And, and a, lot of, a lot of, in my experience, a lot of designers don't do that consciously. Mm -hmm. They do it subconsciously. Mm -hmm. And they think that they're you know, just putting observations into a, a, a drawer to use later. When I say what you're actually doing is understanding the context of the yeah. culture that we live in, and from that, you've got ideas that yeah. would be appropriate to that culture that we yeah. live in. Um, and that's, that's what I think designers do naturally. And we're, more often than not, optimists. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I agree, I think that's important. Um, but it seems to me, in many respects, that we, we're living increasingly in the age of the stylist, yeah. where design is continually being um, re-referenced. Yep. Um, and we see that in the way that um, a lot of graphic design um, mm -hmm. now is um, a sort of pseudo homage to, uh, you know, the work of Sol Bass, yep. and for example, in the movies in particular, mm -hmm. and how popular that is again, yep. um, rather than even look uh, understanding where he may have ca yep. come from and what influences were on him to develop that, and in many ways it came from the techniques and the technology that yep. was available. He was responding to, to the him. culture. Yeah. And so, um, and I, I wonder why that's the case and why there is so much design around now, or maybe it's always been the case that many people are just stylists uh, rather than actually really yeah. uh, looking wider than reading mm. um, the key references being the work of other designers all the time. Yeah, I, I can't say this um, with any data. Um, I can only say it as, a, as a, an assumption or a perception that I'm, I'm getting. Um, and it, it does, with respect to the design education institutes, it does go back to how we're teaching mm -hmm. designers because what has happened is, what I see is we're getting educational institutes turning into factories to produce designers that are taught within that framework of mm -hmm. style and reference to style and reference to technique. Mm -hmm. And what we're not doing, I think it's changing, you know, for a lot of reasons, but what we haven't been doing, and it hasn't filtered through the industry yet, is we haven't actually trained them to think. And that didn't happen to me either. I wasn't trained to think. I was trained to design. 
And it wasn't until I went out into to the industry yep. that I went, whoa, hang on. Okay, comes back to context, comes back to culture, and I started to train myself how to think. And that sounds really stupid, it, it really does, but I think we, we have a, a problem in the education sort of side of things that we're pushing out every year armies of, of designers who think they're gonna be the next star designer, who can't actually think beyond those parameters that you've described. Um, and you couple that with the increasing number of, of students that are going out into the world that we don't have jobs for. Mm. So mm. It's a, it, the, the, they then set up their own companies and they're not trained to think and they're not trained to do business and they're not trained to um, go under a mentorship or anything and they start doing below average design work and then we start to get that filtered through the profession yep. and the clients kind of go, well, I'll get that cheaper. And all of a sudden, we're in the situation where the designers are not necessarily responding to the culture, um, unless we could say the culture now is sort of, um, yeah. you know, the, the kind of parodying of, of previous times. People like Saul Bass and, and Paul Rand and uh, even current designers who, who are showing the way. I mean, they in created our things that people hadn't seen before. Well, yeah, and, and th we, we have to be careful that they will still be influenced by previous Absolutely, work, yeah, yeah. but they're remodeling it and they're redeveloping it and they're representing it mm -hmm. and they're responding to the culture that mm. surrounds us and, and within that context. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, here's a contemporary take mm -hmm. on what's happening today or what mm -hmm. might be happening in the near future. And they, there's few of them. There's I guess the other side of the coin is it can be quite intimidating for young designers oh, given yes. the, yep. I mean, you've only got to look at something interior design, you know. Um, you know, the majority of designers, interior designers, will choose a uh, an Eames design chair 50% um, of the time yeah. uh, over anything else that's been. Pop and how many chairs are there in the world? How many more yeah. chairs do we need yeah. in the world? Yeah. Um, and, and but but it, it's a continuing <coughs> interest and fascination. But at the yeah. same time, it is quite yeah. quite challenging. And, and and there's probably a reason for that. That we look at an Eames chair and say, there's a reason why that's an amazing piece of design. But as an interior designer, you need to know why that is mm. an amazing piece of design and then see, is there something like that elsewhere that I could say, I don't need an Eames chair, I can get something else that is going to be as good, it's going to be appropriate, you know, could be as good as an Eames chair, but because I understand why an Eames chair is so amazing, then I can make a difference, so you can think for yourself. Mm. Most people will say, I've been told for years Eames chairs are the best chairs, so I should get one of those. You know? yeah. and, and then I also need to be able to go out into the marketplace and say, I know what I'm talking about. See, I've chosen Eames chairs. I'm in that club. Yep. And that's, that's kind of where we as designers in education have not been trained, and, and maybe they're doing it now, but have not been trained to present. And that comes into how do you articulate your independent thinking to not convince, but to show the people you're working with why your suggestions uh, informed suggestions are, are worth considering rather than saying, okay, everyone does this, so I'll get the job and I'll look like I know what I'm doing. I was thinking while you were talking, I, I was, for some reason I was also reminded um, of uh, the words of Tibor Coleman, the uh, famous New York mm -hmm. designer, who said that perfection is boring um, and the trick in design is to get it just not quite right, you know, yeah. and famous design of his was a clock with the three turned backwards yep. and people would look at it and just say, yep. it's really interesting and it's different but I just can't work out yeah. why yeah. and it was just yep. those subtle little yep. little witty moments. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and I agree. I mean, it's, it's um, personally I think we have to find the philosophies that we resonate well with because that's a really good example. On the other side, you've got... Um, Famous chef Pierre White, can't remember the, that guy. Marco Pierre Marco White, Pierre White mm -hmm. who says perfection is tiny things done really well together. Mm. So if you say to yourself, you know, the Tibor philosophy is that it's just a little bit left of field, off centre, not quite right. My philosophy is that it makes me uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and people are like that. They, they, you know, if you're Swiss as well, you'd be kind of going, uh, but. Um, then you can look at Marco Pierre White and say, well, I want perfection, but it's achievable when you look at every detail and get every detail 
perfect yeah. and right, and then put them all together. That is something that resonates with me, so I can, yeah. I can go with that. I think the problem is that we have so many things that are out there that sound great, and, and we kind of think, oh, I best do that, because they're really famous, and they've said that, and I really understand it. But again, it comes back to what resonates with you? What, yeah. what, what is it that makes you tick? And it'll be natural, and you go, that's the philosophy I'll follow. Perhaps Better you also have to be careful mind. that things, we don't see everything as being universal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Eames chair seems to be universal, but um, you know, um, uh, what sort of works well and what was perceived as good design in Iceland may not be good design yep. here because of not just climate but mm. how climate affects the culture and the topography and, the, and what we see, the colours that we see every day and our, the, what, how we interpret the world. I'm kind of reminded too of the, um, the research Telstra did many years ago where they, uh, uh, obviously, they universally and still today get a lot of complaints about the quality of their service. So they research, well, what is this thing called quality? And uh, <laughs> oh, the what they service? found was there's significant cultural differences. The Japanese, for yeah. the Japanese, quality equals perfection, yep. which means it must not only work well but must have, mm. must be beautiful. Mm. Um, but for the Germans, it's about precision. Mm -hmm. and so they're similar but not quite the same. Mm. And for Americans, it's about size. Mm. Uh, you know, if it's a house, it's got to be big. If it's a phone, it's got to be small. Mm. But interestingly, for Australians, uh, it wasn't something tangible at all. It was about um, uh, relationships. Mm. In other words, a quality outcome was where we're all still friends at the end of it. Mm. Um, so it's almost as if, and you know, working uh, with a large number of people in architectural practice over the years, it resonated with me that often there was a preparedness to sacrifice the quality just so that everyone was mm. part of the team. Yep. You know, whereas the Germans are sort of, yep. we don't care what you think, this is how we're going to do it. You know? yep. Whether I like you or not at the end, it yeah. doesn't matter. There's, there's, um, I would summarise that into uh, something that I, I kind of um, realised years ago was um, there's no right and there's no wrong, mm. there's only appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think if we look at that and say, Again, if you, if you take the model I said about self-client and you take yourself out of that and say, it's not about what I want or don't want, what's appropriate to what we can do here? Because yeah. what is my end goal? My end goal is um, either you know, a chair or it's um, a passive revenue stream or it's a building or whatever. What is the end goal? What, what is appropriate for that end goal? Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, and I've, I've, I've got you know, friends in the industry who've gone into organizations who've said, we want to have a, um, a website and a new brand and a new this, that, and the other. And they sit there and go, hmm, hmm, right. Mm. No, you don't need any of that. You just need a good HR manager. Mm -hmm. And they went, oh, yeah, okay. You do that first because that's the appropriate solution to what you need now. That m may then lead to the website and the, you know, everything else. But we need to look at what we do and we said earlier, observing culture and, and the world and, and business and how relationships and systems and networks work and we as designers, we, we see patterns between things. We need to be professional enough. That's not confident or have the courage to. We need to be professional enough to say, I know what you're asking for, but I actually think you're looking for this. You hire me to say that. Uh, and that comes back to it's not good, it's not bad, it's not right, it's not wrong, it's appropriate. Um, and then you can go and work in Germany, or you can work in Australia, mm. or you can work in Japan, because your goal is appropriate. Mm. It's not good, bad, right, wrong. Uh, I'd like to take just another little change of tack and come back, um, try to sort of bring this back to the issue of the side project mm -hmm. again. I think one of the questions I am keen to ask you, which is, is whether you've had a favourite project whether there's been a project, mm. uh, and perhaps favourite's not the right word, but a, a project that really made you stop and rethink and that sort of changed your views yep. about things and that yep. had, a, had a significant influence and you feel like it'll be something that will carry, yep. you'll carry with you for the, for the yep. rest of your career. And could uh, you talk about that project yep. and how, it, just a little bit of detail about how it came about and, mm -hmm. and what happened and, and what you brought to it and, and yep. what it means to you? Uh, I would say, um, whether we call it a side project or self-client or whatever we call it, I think the, the project that has currently had the biggest impact on me is Open Manifesto. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why it's had a big impact on me is, well, it's multi-layered, but I stopped looking at what my industry was producing. And I started to look at how are we thinking. And I made a point early on, like in issue one, to say, um, I need to look, I, I'm interested in seeing design's relationship between political, social, cultural, and economic issues, because that's the culture and the context with, within which we live. Um, and I'll be honest, at the time I had no idea what I was talking about. I just said, that's the kind of area that I think <coughs> we need to be looking at. Um, I'd never interviewed anybody, ever. The first person I ever interviewed was Vince Frost, who some of you may know, very famous designer. Um, I was going through uni admiring Vince's work, and here I am sitting there pretending I know what I'm doing to interview him. It's like, <laughs> am I crazy? Um, but sometimes you've got to kind of put yourself out there. Totally, yes. And so, because, because, and I guess to, to that point, um, and I have said this before, but in previous um, um, presentations, but for me, Open Manifesto has been the best laxative you could ever have. <laughs> because when you're sitting there and you're saying, I have to have a coherent conversation where I'm interviewing somebody like Noam Chomsky, it frightens the absolute crap out of you. But what it also does is says, I cannot be asking Noam Chomsky about, did you like the latest piece of work from Stefan Seidmeister? Do you prefer serif or sans serif typefaces? You know, it's like, it's this, it starts to really look mindless. So I, st I, 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 I this project moved me out of um, focusing on the end products and, and really looking at learning in other fields. And the impact that that has made on me is that I now bring that back into my work. Mm -hmm. And I can, um, I can go to my clients and, it might sound silly, but I can ask questions. Um, but not just ask questions, but ask the right questions. Because I'm training myself in Open Manifesto. If I get a half an hour with Noam Chomsky, I've got to ask the right questions. I can't just ask a question. Yeah. So I, and I have to get to a point fast, and I need to have a structure in that conversation that is getting me to an end point. And I need to be able to go with that person if they go off campus. You know, for example, with Noam Chomsky, it's an example I use regularly. I, I was sitting in my bedroom with a phone on speakerphone and a recorder and 10 questions. <coughs> they were the 10 questions I was going to ask him. And I had 20 other questions here in case he went off campus. And I said, if he goes anywhere, I need to know that I can ask another question in that area because if I don't, I'm going to lose an opportunity to learn something from somebody who uh, has a lot to share. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then I can bring that into my client work and I can start asking questions or even in my own work, in my own self-client work, ask questions. Um, the other thing that, that Open Manifesto has done to me, and I'm incredibly fortunate for this, is um, it's given me a profile on the world stage that I did not expect. Yeah. I was in Kuala Lumpur in a hotel waiting to interview uh, a branding guru called Wally Olins. Um, there was a, a design conference there. He was speaking. I went to Kuala Lumpur specifically to meet him and interview him in the hotel foyer. Um, and while I was waiting for him, uh, a group of, <coughs> I didn't realize, but a group of the speakers came down and they were all kind of standing around. And uh, one guy came up to me and said, um, hi, I'm Paul Hughes. Um, I said, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Kevin Finn. Said, okay. And are you one of the speakers? He said, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just here to interview Wally Ollins. Oh, really? For what publication? Oh, you would not. No, you would not. No, what publication? No, it's, it's this little publication in, in Australia. What's it called? It's called Open Manifesto. You do Open Manifesto? This is an Irish guy living in Amsterdam who I don't think had been to Australia before, knew not only who I was from Open Manifesto, but knew what it was. And I said, how the hell do you know about Open Manifesto? And he said, well, you've had Ed Edward de Bono write for you. And I'm a big fan of Edward de Bono. And I'm, where can I buy your publication? Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking to myself, that would not have happened um, anywhere near the level that it has 
purely from my design work. And that's not to say I think my design work is, is less than that. It's because Open Manifesto was not about me. Mm -hmm. It was about everybody else that I think is interesting in the world. And it's about how we question where the yep. field is. Um, and by taking myself out of the project, it brought me so much more. And do I understand that the, the key the key driver for you in pursuing that was so that you could learn more about how to think. Or Partly. To, to, to see how other people think and to think about thinking. I think this... Yeah. I think this... Uh, I think... I'm saying I think, I think. Um, <laughs> I think this idea of meta-thinking, mm. uh, um, we don't do enough. And I think uh, I remember when I first started my first practice as a sort of 23-year-old just registered architect... Um, I would, you know, just stare at the walls thinking, the ideas aren't coming, the ideas yep. aren't coming. And we, we're not, we still feel lazy yep. about thinking. We don't feel mm -hmm. that it's right. We don't value it. And we yep. also don't, we don't do enough thinking about how we think uh, and training ourselves to rethink things and stop and reframe. And, it's even deeper you know. than that. We put pressure on ourselves to be creative on demand. Hmm. Um, I used to freak out about what if a client came to me with a brief and I didn't know the answer. And I'm not talking about we have a client, you know, when I was a young, a young designer in Dublin. I wasn't talking about I have a client, I have a brief, I don't know what the answer would be. I'm talking about what if that happened? What if I didn't know the answer? I used to freak out. And then when I get a brief, I'd be, you know, almost going to hyperventilating. Yep. What I discovered was, and I, I say this to my clients now, to their face, um, oh, lovely, great project, and um, that sounds great, uh, and you know what, I have absolutely no idea what we're going to do for you. None. Why? Because I have no preconceived ideas. I'm not going to come to you and say, I'm currently interested in stripes and circles, and that's what we're going to do for you. <coughs> I say, I have no idea what we will do. So what we need is information. And the more information we have, the more we'll be able to find what's appropriate. So I, I will say to a client, if I don't have enough information, I can't give you what you need. Or it's going to be a truncated version of what you need. The more information we have, then the more we can get ideas from. Because ideas, really, they rarely come out of nowhere. Okay. Um, so as a designer, we then say, okay, we have this information and we see the patterns and the connections with what is there in reality, tangible, not made up, idea, creative. It's here. And then we say, what can we do with that bit of information? And that's when it comes to your strategic insight. And you say, ah, I've read all this information. And um, what I say about my practice is um, I'm interested in getting complex information and making it simple and accessible. Yep. So you get all the stuff and you go, yep, 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 I reckon that's, that's what you're talking about right there and we're going to build it around that. And it comes from what you gave me, yep. not from something I made up. So let's just explore this idea of, if you like, um, researching a project mm -hmm. or finding out about a project or yep. um, analyse it, if you like. Yep. Um, it seems to me that the models, whether it be graphic design um, or architecture, they tend to be the sort of same. You know, there's this process where there's mm -hmm. research and data collection yep. and then you analyse it yep. and then there's this sort of messy process of synthesis where you try and develop ideas and you try and discipline that because you're running a business and mm -hmm. you've got meetings and you've got other timetables. You've got that half an hour in the day. I've got to mm -hmm. get this concept done. Um, and I wonder if we become lazy and we fall back on just the old, same old way that we do everything and we wonder why we're not moving ahead, yep. as they say. Yep. And I once, I, heard, I can't remember who said it, but someone said we could learn a lot about how to find out about something by watching a dog. Oh. Um, you know, a dog sees something strange on the ground, it walks up to it a little bit, mm. barks at it, um, sort of sniffs it, yep. um, rolls in it, um, picks it up, tosses it in the air, and it, and it kind of was making me think that, you know, we kind of, in our own way, we need to play with it. Yeah. The thing we need to kind of get uh, comfortable with it, get comfortable mm. with it, play with it, you know, sketch it, um, yeah. 
tear it up and put it back together again in a sort of data kind of way. But we tend, you know, in in our normal work, we, yep. we're professional. We don't do that yep. sort of thing. Yep. Um, and so I'm curious about how you sort of try to get to the get you your understanding of yep. what the real problem is and and how much it involves talking to the client, mm -hmm. looking at precedents. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's, there's there's two two kind of things. Um, one, I, I look at it and I say, <clears throat> okay, we've got a half an hour. Okay, right, there's your parameter. You, uh, you go with the best plan you have at that time. You say, I've had that amount of time with that amount of information. That's my professional opinion in the time. There I go. They want to see it in half an hour. That's it. If they're looking for the Sistine Chapel, it's not going to happen. Um, the other way to do it, I've done this and other people do this as well. I don't do that regularly because I tend to use those parameters as a good creative incentive. But there are other people who go and say, and I have in the past, um, okay, um, I know I'm supposed to see you in half an hour with this thing, but I'm not ready. I'll see you tomorrow. And they go, oh, what do you mean? I've, you're, we're supposed to see you in half an hour. I go, well, you can see me in half an hour and it'll be half as good as it will be tomorrow. Do you want it better tomorrow? Or do you want a half good idea today? Because um, you might think in the business world of six minute units mm -hmm. that we can just go, right, there's your answer. That doesn't always happen. And in this case, I'm gonna be professional enough and big enough to say, if you wait another day or another week, or I need more information, then we're gonna be able to come back with a better idea. The other thing I wanna talk about is there's the research side of it. Mm -hmm. um, another reason, well, to, for your sake as well, to bring it back to the side project or to the to self-client. The other reason um, that I started Open Manifesto was that I was getting frustrated with researching a very narrow interest for a client-specific business. It was always learn as much as you can within this narrow path. And Open Manifesto was learn as much as you can this big. So it was a kind of a reaction to the traditional model of research in, in our field, which is learn as much as you need for this project as fast as you can to get that solution out as quick as you can, to get it built or made and produced, and then on to the next project. To then research really deeply on just that facet of what they do. So it wasn't big enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes from the process that we get trained to do. So I try and use broad brush strokes now. Uh, and that's where Open Manifesto came into it. And I will, <coughs> for those of you who, who are familiar with Open Manifesto, you'll know this, but the people that I interview or, or get to write for me in Open Manifesto, they're as diverse as leading design, what might call celebrities, <coughs> through to experts in their fields like Alan Savory, who's a, an environmental scientist, or Tom Zollner, who's an investigative journalist, right through to Larry J. Kolb, who's an ex-CIA agent, through to Master Legend, who's a real-life superhero in Florida. So it's not that we, we look at the world for that deep research and just even stay in the, in the wide sphere of graphic design or even the wide sphere of, of design. The research that I'm interested in is right across the spectrum because... Um, Again, it was a reaction to that model of deep research that's very myopic. Mm -hmm. I was getting frustrated with that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where that side project started. We, we're going to start to wrap up a little bit mm -hmm. and then we'd like to throw, throw it out to the floor for some questions. Mm -hmm. But um, another one of the um, things that uh, I'd like to put to you is whether there is a particular talent or mm -hmm. attribute I thought about this. <laughs> that you don't already have, that you would perhaps like to have. Um. I reckon nuclear physics. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I, I, um, I think um, learning, knowing more about business, how business operates. Okay. Not, yeah. not to make money, not to say uh, <clears throat> the more I know about business, the, the, the more wealthy I'll be or the more success. I, 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 see, I see in business a particular kind of um, creative thinking that mm. fascinates me. 
Um, and the more I know about that, and I'm actively seeking to, to learn a lot about that, but the more I know about it, the more I can take what resonates with me and mm -hmm. apply it to my clients and to my own business. Mm. Um, because as Ayos Bissell says, it is about designing our life. You know? And I, I think it's the skills that were not given to me or I wasn't smart enough to, to seek. Are you talking in, about in, entrepreneurs in particular? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I've been incredibly um, flattered by um, a gentleman by the name of um, Stephen Heller, who's, some of you may know, he's written about 140 books on design. Um, but he once described me as uh, an entrepreneur of ideas, and I actually almost apologized to him and said, can you retract that, because I, that's not me. I, whew, I can't live up to that. Um, but I stopped myself and thought, well, hang on, if he sees me that way, I, I actually, I'm gonna challenge myself Mm -hmm. and say, how can I live up to that? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was the seed for me to stop thinking about side projects and start thinking about self-clients because the word entrepreneur was included and I never, ever thought that would have applied to me. But it's easy for any of us to do it. If we start looking at it in the way that Jordan Belfort says, monetize your passion, you automatically, by default, will become an entrepreneur because you say, what? If I design the way for this to make some money for me, because I love doing it, well, you'll be an entrepreneur and a designer. Uh, and entrepreneurs actually are fantastic designers. And I think that um, part of the message there is that uh, when talking about entrepreneurs and what you started with when we first started talking was that the most important, perhaps, message that might come out of tonight's talk is that we should think about making ourselves our number one project always. Yeah, yeah. our life. Um, <coughs> yeah. Um, and our number one client. Yep. Um, I, I um, if anyone was at the Creative Three conference recently, but uh, um, again, pardon me, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat this. Um, there's a um, a band in, in the US called Jane's Addiction. I'm a fan. They're like a punk rock band. Uh, and they've got a song called Classic Girl. And um, one of the, the lyrics, or, couple of the lyrics are um, they say they say they were the, those were the days but anyway you know for us these are the days mm. that's the message for this it's for us these are the days if we don't treat this in the way I.S. Bissell says your life is your most important project if we don't do that then we might not be here tomorrow and, and what, what are we doing you know, it comes back to making it meaningful. It comes back to saying, if we do what we want to do for ourselves and our family and our friends and our community, we've got to start thinking about today. It took me eight years to do a manifesto. Bad use of time. So that's, I think, the... the that you've learned, learned from that. I have, minutes. yes. Yes, and design nerd took a year. <laughs> it was like, got the idea, going to do it, produced within a year. And now we're, we're re-looking at that and we're, we're looking at it like a self-client and we're going back into it from a business point of view saying we can do uh, more and better with this, not to make money, but to get more information out to people. Lots of what I'm doing right now in terms of Open Manifesto, in terms of Design Nerd, in terms of some of the clients I'm working with is all about learning, education, sharing knowledge. That excites me. Thanks, Kevin. We will we'll throw it to the floor a bit now. And you did remind me of that old saying that um, uh, tomorrow is the day after yesterday. So get started now. Yeah, um, <coughs> don't wait. Do we have any questions uh, from the floor? And if I could ask you to go to the microphone, because we are recording tonight's um, talk. Please, can you come down and give us your, yep. Thanks, Christian. How about I ask a question on the way? Because I've, yeah. I've, um, I'm re I really love this idea of the self-client and also the, the tax deduction implications that, that <laughs> might uh, introduce for private lunches and those kinds of things. He's thinking like a businessman. Really. <laughs> yes. But um, sure. your, your business focus as well, Kevin, um, you're, you're actually talking about a non-conventional business model and operating uh, in a non-conventional way. And I, I'm interested in uh, what you think um, the size of your practice and the scale of your practice, how that benefits your ability to do this, 
have this kind of great balance between passion and, and monetizing it. And whether you think that model is scalable yeah. or whether you're critical of big design practices and their inability to innovate. And so many firms we see have their business as usual in an innovation department. So. Yep. I'll start by saying I don't judge anyone. Um, we go back to the right, wrong, good, bad, appropriate. Um, I, I know I've got very good, uh, Vince Russell's a good friend of mine, he's got a big studio, and I don't judge that. I just say that's where he's at, that's what he, it wouldn't be me, um, but I admire him to the roof, he's, you know, I, I, I couldn't do it. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of what I do, um, my approach is scalable because it is all to do with collaboration. And if I have a project that's coming in that I don't have the skills or the resources, well, then I bring that in. And, and don't bring it in in the way that is, shh, I'll subcontract, don't tell the client. I'm up front saying, okay, <clears throat> we need that expertise, we need that resource, we're going to bring it in, you are going to meet that collaborator, Mr. and Mrs. Client, and it's all going to be upfront and, um, and uh, transparent. The good side of that is that I'm not going to my client saying, my fees include 26 staff, big premises, all the overheads. I'm going in saying, my fees are going to be in relation to what the value of the project is and who's involved. Um, in terms of growing, I don't see my studio growing in numbers, personnel, but I would like it to grow in terms of impact and in terms of the people that I'm working with, um, the size of the projects. But I don't need to grow my, my, my I can grow my business, but I don't need to grow my studio. Um, <clears throat> and that again is kind of counterintuitive and it's, um, it's a challenge. But um, like we said at the very beginning, it's, it's sort of the natural thing. From, it's how I'm naturally steering towards and I've learned not to fight where you're naturally moving towards. Uh, and it excites me that if I'm collaborating, the name of my studio recently changed from Fin Creative to The Sum Of, is exactly for that reason. Um, I'm putting on the door my philosophy and belief in collaboration, and it's the sum of everybody involved, and I'm not at the top of the pyramid. Um, I may have a significant role at a particular point in the project. I may have a, an ongoing influence in the project, but I don't see myself as the, the top of the pyramid. It's the sum of everyone involved. Um, and not in a kind of a, a full egalitarian, democratic way, in a really, that's what I, I kind of believe. So. Marina. Um, Marina Kozel, architect, fan of graphic design and also fan of Kevin's work. I um, wanted to ask you about this process that you go through when you're researching the expansive process. So you're dealing with so many uh, futurists and uh, futurist themes. And then, so you're going out there, it's almost like time travel. You've just gone so far forward. And then you come back into your own studio space and you have to synthesize that. Yep. And you have to uh, gauge the status quo. Yep. And it's almost an impatience uh, that I certainly have. But how do you cope with that? Yep. <clears throat> it's a good question because, um, as I said at the very beginning, side projects get started because you're frustrated in your job or you're interested in something else and when you go out there and you, 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 you talk to certain people or you're in that space that really excites you and then you come back to your job or your studio and go, oh, we're back here again, okay. That, that is the danger. Um, it goes back to the appropriate again. Um, going out, talking to all these amazing people through Open Manifesto in particular, uh, and, and reading all the stuff that I read and researching. I'm constantly researching to find who I'm going to be speaking to in the next issue of Open Manifesto, so I'm constantly on the lookout for interesting things. But it it's just goes into your mind bank. And then you come back to a client, and you, you don't switch anything off or switch anything on. Naturally, you start to draw from what you've learned from people, and you bring it <coughs> into the project in an appropriate way and say, hey, have you thought about doing this in the bigger picture, in the wider context? I saw this recently that kind of relates to what you're doing now or this innovation and technology over here may not be right for that part of your business, but what about this part of your business? So what you end up doing, what I end up doing with all of this, the, the material and the people I'm speaking to and the people that I'm incredibly fortunate to have access to, um, within all that information and all that knowledge, I do exactly like we all do in a design project 
I'll look for the patterns, I'll look for what's appropriate for certain things, and then I'll bring that to the, to the table. I don't go in and say, you know what, I know we're talking about a, um, a book project for kids, but um, there's this XCIA guy that I know in, you know. <laughs> it, but you, you'll, you'll pick something that might say, well, hang on, maybe there's something there that seems irrelevant to the project but can bring something new to the project. So you just find the patterns and you find where that information is going to be appropriate for the project. And when you get a little bit frustrated uh, with, with a, a client that might be a little bit narrower than you'd like, there's always the, the security that you say, I still have open manifest, so I'm going to go back to that again. So it becomes a bit of a safety net as well. I think that's, pro I think that's probably all we have time for, unless anyone has a quick question. Um, okay, one, qu yeah. one quick one. But we'll take Thank this you. conversation into design nerd world. And, uh, <laughs> we invite you all to come in. After this question, I have a question for myself, which I'll share with everyone. Hi, I just wanted to um, ask what advice you'd give to graduates coming out of design school. Yep, I have very specific um, advice for graduates. Um, my, in my experience, when graduates ask that question, um, a designer or a professional will say, what you need is, and there's a list, you know, what you need to do is this, what you need... And, and I tell graduates, uh, I'm going to tell you what you don't need. And it's only two things. The first thing you don't need is fear. Um, you walk into a design studio or an architecture practice or an interior design studio, just because you're a graduate, do not be afraid to voice your opinion. You've got a head on your shoulders, you've just come out of, uh, of a, a, a quite a, a luxury of, of exploring and learning stuff without pressure of delivering. Um, bring what you know. You've got a voice, you've got a head on your shoulders, you've got an opinion. Do not be afraid to talk. Which leads you to the second thing you don't need. Arrogance. You don't know everything. So don't use your right to not be afraid and say, I'm going to tell you what you should do. <laughs> I've seen a lot of graduates do that. They come out and they say, well, I've got a degree and I can tell you what to do. Um, so I've just said two things you don't need, fear and arrogance. And if we flip that around, what I think you do need is confidence and humility. And if you can do that, it's, it'll take you a long way in a design studio or in, in any profession because um, the worst thing you can do is sit there and say nothing or sit there and say everything that you think is the right answer and defend it to the death. I'm right. So that would be what I would say about that. Uh, I have a question for Kevin. Kevin, why is SBS up on the screen? Um, <coughs> I was approached by the head of design at SBS in 2008, um, and she said um, in an email, um, would you be interested in talking to us about rebranding SBS? Of course, I almost fell out of my skin and went, yeah, of course, jeez, yeah, yes. Uh, long story short, I asked them, how the hell did you hear about me? At the time, I'd been, I was living and working in Kununara, was there for eight months. Um, I wasn't really going out promoting the work from Satya Design because I felt that I needed to have a bit of a separation from that. <clears throat> and apart from the fact that I was a 10 hour flight from Sydney and I was a solo practitioner, independent, um, and I was in operation for eight months as an independent, uh, I was thinking, how did they find out about me? What, what, how did this ever happen? How did I ever get on the list? Turns out, the head of design saw a feature article in a UK design magazine about Open Manifesto. At the bottom was Open Manifesto website and my design practice website. And she went, oh, I'll have a look at that. And she went and looked and went, oh, this guy, okay. He's got good credentials from Sachi's. He's, I like the work he's doing and da 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 da, -da. We'll, we'll, we'll go speak to him. And again, long story short, very, very fortunate to be selected and I, and I work with SBS and I, I did the identity. That probably wouldn't have happened if I didn't do a side project called Open Manifesto. When we look at what we're doing, 
the things that we love, the side projects that I hope will become self-clients, if you're doing it really for the right reason uh, and you really believe in it, you have absolutely no idea what door that's going to open. I had no idea that was going to lead to SPS, and I had no idea that it was going to lead to me getting some kind of a profile internationally. I had no idea. Um, and lots of other things that have happened. So from, from that experience, I, I can honestly say, if you go into what you do with a, with a good heart and an open mind, and you really want to do it because you love doing it, and you want to share it with people, then you, and you want to make it meaningful for you and other people, that you don't know where that's going to go. And that is uh, evidence of, of something that started out with such a, a, a um, low expectation for me into something that is, is just been enriching. So um, I, I would say please do think about a side project and think of it very quickly as a self-client uh, and, and do it for a living or make a part of what you do. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it's been uh, a really interesting evening. We never know what's going to eventuate in, in these discussions and what... Um, I wasn't too what, convoluted. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so at all. Um, I think a couple of the key things that we... Uh, that certainly I picked up tonight was that um, uh, probably more than becoming our own client, we need to become our own design hero um, mm. as designers. And um, <clears throat> get used to working outside your comfort zone because Absolutely. every time you do that... Um, you grow. Um, if you stay inside your comfort zone, you don't grow. So um, if you're not I scared, know it's easier said than done, but after you do it the first time, second time becomes easier yep. and it becomes habit forming. If so, you're not scared, be scared that you're not scared. Yeah. Um, Kevin Finn, thank you very much. Thank it's you. been very enlightening. You're a great example to many of us here. Today. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And, um, please thank our, our yes. MC again, Shane Thompson, for a great conversation. <laughs> so our next event, again in two weeks, will be um, designer um, Christina Waterson talking about her side projects and, and confronting the same challenging questions. Um, make sure you RSVP, and then we have Andrew Ballantyne um, coming from the UK for the final lecture two weeks after that. So please come and join us in the Design Lounge, and thanks again.